And hello, everybody. Welcome to Philosophy for the People. We are joined once again by the wonderful Dr. Gavin Kerr. Mm. And today we are going to stress test Thomism and uh, <laughs> the Deante yeah. argument. We're going to we're going to throw a bunch of objections, a fair number of objections against mm. Aquinas's Deante argument. Gavin, of course, has a lot of published work in this area. He has been on this podcast to discuss it various times before. Mm. And it, I don't know, it just seems to me that there's been more conversation recently against either the Deante argument itself or certain aspects of it. So we thought, uh, yeah, this might be a good educational opportunity to uh, yeah. bring up some of these objections and mm. see if uh, see if Aquinas makes it through. How's that sound to you, Gavin? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I'm uh, happy to do that. And, you know, thanks for having me on the show again. You know, it's always a pleasure to be here. But yeah, um, you know, that, that sounds great. I think I think it's great that so much um, sort of attention is being placed on this um, from Aquinas because it, what it highlights is it's, it's a um, piece of philosophical thought um, from Aquinas that not only deserves to be scrutinized, but that can stand to be scrutinized. It's up there, you know, with Kant's critique, with, you know, Descartes' meditations, and, you know, with a lot of the classics in the history of philosophy. And, I mean, not only will you get people that, that disagree with the metaphysics, which um, <clears throat> buttresses the position, but you'll also get readers of that position who want to defend it, but will give it a different account than say maybe a, an account that I would defend or whatever. So, so it shows there's just, there's a lot of different twists and turns that we can take in the metaphysics here. And I mean, that just showcases just how high profound a piece of philosophy that it is because all the great philosophers and works of philosophy have that they've got their opponents and they also have their defenders, but who defend it in different ways and raise different issues. Um, so it's good that we're here you know, sort of dealing with that and stress testing that and continuing um, the discussion of, I mean, what I think is one of the finest pieces of uh, philosophical writing in the history of Western thought. Yeah, I agree with you. Those are some wonderful comments, Gavin. And let me just say a few more things by way of preliminary. First off, apologies for the sudden time change. It's just that an hour sooner worked better for Gavin and I. So here we are. Uh, so thank you for all those who <laughs> still saw us go live an hour early. It's just these things happen sometimes. Uh, secondly, in terms of the objections, I have gathered them from different sources and categorized them in different ways. So some of the objections are going to be objections against the sort of background metaphysics. Mm. Some of the objections are going to be uh, against, you know, one of the core features of the argument, the multiplicity yeah. argument, for example, the real distinction. Yeah. And then some of the objections will be related to other steps, you know, concerning causal regresses. And, and I think I threw in one or two there against the conclusion or the coherent coherence of subsistent existence. So I tried to like <laughs> get a good, mm. well-rounded balance of the objections. Some of them yeah. uh, I got from just the literature. Uh, some of them I pulled uh, from people who've sent something like this in either through email or whatever and, and said, Hey, you know, this is something I've been thinking about. Could you, it's always, can you have Gavin on to talk about this? It's always, they always want Gavin on to talk about it. <laughs> not, not Pat, not Pat. What do you think? Who cares about Pat? Think? Can you have Gavin on? Be so sure. So they're, they're coming from a couple different places. And a few of them actually, Gavin, I, I pulled from your uh, collected articles volume uh, okay. because you've obviously got a lot in there that it, you mm -hmm. have a whole chapter on Dante, but you also have a chapter on uh, essentially ordered causal series and stuff like that. So I think we've got a good, serious these are not these are not kindergarten objections we've got yeah. we've got good serious objections that's what we like because mm -hmm. objections are argument testers mm -hmm. and that's what we want to do right we want to test arguments we want to test positions so that means we want the best objections that we can find so that's where we're coming from Absolutely. and uh yeah. so gavin uh, i don't want you to rehearse the whole thing again because we've done <clears throat> at least one entire episode on day and day before so i just mm. i want to I want to assume that people have a general familiarity with the argument so we could spend yep. most of the time on the objections, but it might be useful maybe if you just give a, a brief overview or a brief sketch of, of the argument for people who might just be hopping in here and haven't heard yeah. it again. I know that's hard. I know that's asking a lot, but uh, yeah. you're pretty well rehearsed in it, so go for it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I literally taught this this afternoon in one of my classes at the university today, this argument. So uh, it's still all fresh in the head. And, you know, I've been teaching a, a course on a, the thought of Aquinas this semester, and we're right deep in the metaphysics at the minute. So this is just, you know, all quite fresh at the minute. So, well, the argument from the Deente, um, it comes in chapter four of the Deente at Essentia. Aquinas is trying to deal with essence, uh, being in essence, as uh, they're found in things. Uh, and in chapter four, um, 
because he wants to deny a position called universal hylomorphism, having denied universal hylomorphism, he needs to give an account of how uh, things uh, which don't have matter can still have some element of potency. And the point there is the consideration of whether matter is the principle of potency, not just a principle of potency, but the principle of potency. Um, universal hylomorphosis thought, well, matter is the principle of potency. So even immaterial things have some kind of matter, which is uh, incorporeal matter. Okay. So they have matter, but it's incorporeal and that accounts for their potency. Aquinas has any issues with that, which we, I mean, we don't need to get into the gentle listeners. If they want to, you know, pick that up in the comments, you know, we can talk about that. But the, mo the, the, the real distinction between essence and existence is motivated to answer that issue. And so the idea, he, he distinguishes between essence and existence, that in things there is a distinction between their essence, you know, their quiditas, you know, that's what, that's what constitutes them as what they are, and the act of existence, that's what that which actualizes their essence. So Aquinas establishes this real distinction between the two. And then he goes on to consider, <clears throat> you know, well, look, with, um, things having existence, do they have it as a result of their intrinsic nature or as a result of some extrinsic principle? And the reason is, well, look, they can't have it as a result of their intrinsic nature because he's just established that essence and existence are distinct. So existence is other than the intrinsic nature and so can't be a part of or a result of that intrinsic nature because without existence, that intrinsic nature just wouldn't be. So existence can't be ontologically or metaphysically posterior to the nature. Okay, so we're led to some extrinsic principle. So we've got an extrinsic principle from which the essence existence composite has existence. Well, what about that? What about that principle? Okay, does it, does it have some principle, you know, um, for its existence? Does it have existence? Um, as a result of its intrinsic nature or an extrinsic principle. Well, if extrinsically, what about that? And so on. And so we're, we build up a causal regress. And Aquinas terminates the regress, you know, interestingly, not in the day end. I'll give you a hint as to how he would terminate it. Uh, but uh, he terminates it in other works. And the way in which he terminates it, the regress, is by considering the metaphysics of per se ordered series. Um, we need not get, get too bogged down in it, uh, but just a, a brief overview of the metaphysics of per se ordered series. In such series, the members of the series don't possess the causality of the series in virtue of what they are. They don't possess it essentially. Okay, so it's a derived causality. So the members of the series derive the causality of the series from something else. And so the classic example is that the mental agent moves his hand to move the stick to move the stone. The hand, stick, and stone don't possess the causality, i.e. the motion of that series in virtue of what they are. They can be hands, sticks, and stones without motion. So they don't possess it in virtue of being hands, sticks, and stones. So they possess it, as Thomas says in the Deante, per aliud, through another. The other through which they possess it has to be capable of causing that causality and so has that causality essentially. So the mental agent, qua mental agent, is able to originate that causality in the hand, stick, and stone, so that they participate in the causality of that mental agent so that they themselves can have causality. Without that mental agent as primary cause, the hand, stick, and stone just wouldn't have the causality of the series, the motion. So per se, ordered series fall apart as causal series without a primary cause for the causality of the series. Existence is like that um, in things in which essence and existence are distinct. Things in which essence and existence are distinct don't have existence as a result of their intrinsic nature, but they have it as a result of an extrinsic principle, like the hand stick and the stone um, being dependent for their motion. Well, if that's the case, existence is a kind of causality located in per se ordered series, in which case, if there isn't a primary cause of that causality, which possesses that causality, existence essentially, then the members of the series just wouldn't have the causality, the causality here being existence. So the members of the series wouldn't exist. Essence, existence, composites wouldn't exist. But they do exist, in which case there must be a primary cause which um, has existence essentially. Its essence is its existence, without which um, nothing, without which things that um, are composites of essence and existence uh, would not be. And so um, that's the that's the gist of the yeah. Argument. Yeah, that that's great. And then, of course, there's all what people call stage two these days, where you run the conceptual analysis on a being whose essence is his existence in relation to mm -hmm. the wider background metaphysical 
system of act and potency and you unleash the divine attributes essentially right yeah, yeah. yeah. all right uh so we might get into some of that as we move through the objections so that mm. was a, a great summary statement again if people want a more detailed um yeah exposition of that argument we've done at least one full episode on dante <laughs> i feel like we've done more than that at this point oh but yeah it's it's, yeah. it's 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 there so people can look back mm. through the channel i will find it and i will link it in the comments after this video for easy access gavin shall we head to the objections now yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's, you know, sort of bring them on, throw them about and just see where we're at with them. All right, excellent. Let's, uh, so the first kind of category of, uh, or class of objections are going to concern objections against the, the background metaphysics, you know, kind of mm. the, the stuff that, uh, yeah, try to take it down right at the root, if you will. So let's 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 start with this one. Hmm. Uh, I actually have a document this time, so I'm not going to just totally throw <laughs> these off the cuff. So let me pull it up. All right. So the first one is an attack on Aquinas's theory of existence. So the objection might go yeah. something like this, right? That Aquinas's argument, Dante, but probably any of his arguments, right, hmm. only work if existence is a is a property of individuals. Yeah. However, as many people claim, many modern hmm. philosophers, they think this position is absurd. Mm -hmm. uh, for various reasons, but one of the primary objections of why existence can't be a first level property of concrete individuals is they think that that demands that the individual already exists for a property yeah. to inhere in. But obviously yeah. that can't be the case when talking about a thing's existence, right? So this mm -hmm. is clearly absurd. Aquinas' theory of existence itself must be absurd, and if it's absurd, it can't be true, and the whole argument fails. Something like that, yeah. right? Yeah, go. Yeah. So, I mean, that's very much the sort of Phrygian view of existence, that existence is a second-order property. First-order properties um, are like predicates, which um, we, we apply to an individual, and then existence is a second-order property, whereby we say that uh, those predicates um, obtain um, uh, for that individual. So it's a, it's a kind of a quantification sort of view that mm -hmm. if I say the tame tigers exist, you know, well, the tameness and the tigerness of the thing, okay, they're first order and they're applicable to the thing. And when I say that, you know, tame tigers exist, I'm saying that, well, look, um, there, there are some tame tigers that are instanced in the world and that second order, which is applicable to the tameness, the tigerness uh, uh, of the thing as a, whole, as a whole, and that only comes after um, the individual. But um, a move can be made, first of all, within um, uh, Fre Frege's scholarship, um, one can argue that Frege himself recognizes um, a kind of a theory of actuality where there is an account um, of actuality which says that that individual which, uh, of which you know, the first order properties are applicable um, has to itself be described as actual in some way. So we have to attribute to it um, a kind of an actuality. Um, so there is actuality attributable to individuals themselves and not just to the properties of individuals. We're not just saying that the properties of individuals obtain. So mm -hmm. there is room in, um, you know, Phrygian scholarship for that. And that's what I'm going to latch on to when I'm defending Aquinas's um, uh, a view of existence. That, um, okay, Aquinas has room for the second order view of existence. And he sees that as the, the kind of account of, of existence that will figure in a judgment of, you know, of truth, of yeah. affirming, yes, that there are tame tigers, something mm -hmm. like that. So he has room for that second order kind of existence, um, that it is true that tame tigers exist or something like that. But that's not what Aquinas means by the act of existence and things. He does not mean that the act of existence is the fact that the thing is okay and so john whipple uh, you know has focused on that issue i focused on that issue julia klima has focused on that issue to point out that whilst aquinas does have an account of existence signifying truth um that that's uh, and that that is kind of like you know the Phrygian second order that that is not exhaustive of aquinas's view aquinas's view is asking about the individual itself given the distinction between essence and existence the argumentation for which you know comes up uh Prior to this, the individual that exists is not identical to the existence that he has. So there's something that accounts for his actuality, which is attributable to that individual himself. It's that without which the individual as a whole would not be. So anything that is actual within that individual stems um, from that existence, which accounts for the individual as being something rather than nothing. This is something, as I say, that even, you know, in Phrygian scholarship um, that we can recognize, but it's a, an account of existence that, that we get in Aquinas. And so I don't think it's absurd um, to, uh, well, first of all, you know, 
defend this position, but also to ask that question, what is it about that individual, um, which makes it uh, something rather than nothing, because that individual isn't identical um, to its existence. It could just as easily be, or it could just as easily not be uh, as be. Um, and so we, we need to ask that question, what makes it actual rather than non-actual and not account of actuality, whatever it is, whether it be Aquinas's, you know, Thomist essay or some other account of actuality is an actuality that we are attributing to an individual and not just to properties uh, of the individual. And this actually sort of relates to, I'm just seeing a question come up there from Ran Santos uh, in the comments. How can an act- well, we, we can hit it right now if, yeah, if it's convenient, yep. Mm -hmm. How can an act actualize uh, some things that don't exist? This, this is the interesting thing. Um, it's the individual that exists, okay? And so what is being actualized are the components of the individual, but the act, um, you know, which is actualizing the different components of the individual, it's not when we get to the metaphysics of creation and God and everything, it's not that God has taken some actuality here and we've got some non-existent individual here and just adding it to that, that's mm -hmm. not what's happening. God is bringing into existence the individual, and then we as metaphysicians, we have that individual in front of us, and we just analyze it in terms of the different causal dependencies. Essence and, essence and existence are composed in the individual. They're not conjoined, okay? They're composed with each other uh, so that, uh, you know, the act of existence actualizes the essence. So what the act, the act of existence is doing is um, making something that is actual in its actualizing work we have a something okay and, and this metaphysics of creation this is something that uh god you know just does he brings the individual into existence and then the different component parts uh are co-created uh with that but it's not to be thought that you know we're actualizing something that doesn't exist because there isn't a something right the the, the essence isn't a something distinct from existence the something is the existing individual with components which enable it to exist but those components are not themselves some things and and that's kind of i think that's going to come up in some of the other discussions as well yeah great great well we've got a lot of objections to go through so i and i told gavin spend as much or as little time when you said you need and i'm not going to try to interject too much but this one is one that uh i originally thought about a lot as well and it, and there's a lot of modern philosophers who who challenge what's you know this the 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 sort of modern quantificational view of existence um yeah, or not yeah. thomas as well sure and one yeah. i think one a very kind of straightforward way of doing it is just say look why should we why should we think that all properties are characterizing properties in the sense that kant would have it right that they're always mm -hmm. logically posterior to the individual that they're attributed to and by mm -hmm. characterizing we mean that they sort of add to an individual in some way regarding like what it is or how it's configured or something like that, right? It's like mm. adding red to dog, right? Which yeah. leads to greater intention and lesser extension or something like that. Yeah. And I think Thomas, if he was in this modern debate, would probably just want to say, yeah, no, that doesn't have to be the case with mm. with all all properties. It does not have to be logically posterior to the individual. That's yeah. certainly Barry Miller's account, right? He, yeah. he, he straight up denies that all properties yeah. have to be characterizing or logically posterior uh, yeah. to the individual as well. Do you think... Mm. Thomas would speak that way if you were around today. Do you think that's consistent with Thomas's account? Yeah, I mean, I think so because I mean the the reason um, uh, why Kant, you know, ado adopts the view that he does that existence is in the predicate is because predication for Kant is always categorical because um, the mind world relation is such that the that the the mind is brought into operation by uh, engaging with objects in the world through intuition. And that operativity of the mind is a categorical operativity. So the mind can only recognize um, that which it a priori, that which is a priori categorizable in the objects of intuition. So, for instance, if an object of intuition exhibits features of causality, that brings into operation the category of causality. So predication is always going to be categorical for Kant. He doesn't have a place um, to recognize what is more existential um sort of a predication it's always something um within the categories um and 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 that's what sort of you know leads to the, that kantian view um the, the predication is always going to be determining uh, in that sort of conceptual way but we need not accept that view i mean we can accept the kantian view that uh, engagement with the world brings in the operation conceptual capacities but that doesn't mean the predication is always categorical um 
and the, and this is because well i mean there's historical reasons you know kind of why Kant went down that route but we can simply say that you know with Thomas there are different degrees of abstraction uh, and and this is you know famously what he does when he talks about coming to terms with the subject matter of metaphysics that there's a special kind of abstraction and a focus um, that the metaphysician engages on where we consider simply the being of things um, not you know the abstracted universal which the physicist consists and not um, the abstracted figure which the mathematician consists but this notion of separatio whereby engaging with the thing, we can, you know, distinguish or separate out those different features of it without which it would not be, one of which um, is existence. And, you know, that need not be a kind of categorical uh, determination of the thing, but that whereby, you know, you have a thing uh, rather than nothing. Right. So when we say that we always like to use Thumper around here, if, you know, when we say that Thumper exists, that doesn't need to signify a pre-existing subject in which <laughs> existence is dumped into, which it adheres, right? It can just signify, yeah. if we're Thomas, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, a bounded instance of existence, right? Yeah. A restricted act of existence, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's exactly. And there's nothing incoherent about that. You might need to work more out about that account, mm -hmm. But yeah. certainly there's nothing absurd about that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And interestingly, this was, I mean, I'm just noticing another question came up there from Adam D Dildersfield. Um, so whether we call that which we reference a thing or something or some other term, how are we to say, how are we able to say that it is not? Sounds like we're saying that what is not is. I mean, this was a classic issue that came up. I mean, AJ Ayer uh, brings this up the, the, you know, when we, if we're going to say that existence is, you know, a property of something, you know, it's a, it's a real feature of things, then we have to say non-existence is a real feature of things as well. And so we have to say that the X has this real feature that it doesn't exist. So the X has to be something, have the real feature, um, yeah. that doesn't exist. But back to this sort of, a, a, a Kantian stuff that, um, so, so we take Kant that the mind-world relation is not one of representation, but one of intentionality. That um, the when it, whenever we uh, think about objects, we think about them by means of conceptual content, or as Frege would say, a sense. So not by means of a representative idea in our minds, the way for, the way um, Descartes or Locke or even Berkeley were told, but by means of a kind of a, a sense or a conceptual content, uh, by means of which we designate the thing that we're thinking about, intent yeah. content. So if we designate the thing that we are thinking about by an intentional content, that doesn't mean that the thing has to exist. You know, Frege kind of points this out. Every sort of, you know, sort of a proposition, okay, with a sense, it has a reference. Okay, it's it's referring to something, but what it refers to may not exist. So if we take, you know, like a proposition, like what's north of the North Pole or... Mm -hmm black hole at the center of the galaxy, there may not be actual reference for what those propositions refer to. Nevertheless, they carry a reference because they have a sense. Yeah. We're intending to refer to something, even if there's nothing there to refer to, our intentions allow us to refer to it. So when we say, you know, that you know, <laughs> unicorns don't exist or something, we're intending the conceptual content that you know we would use to pick out unicorns if there were unicorns yes <laughs> okay. right when we say that unicorns don't exist what we're saying is that you know there is nothing that that sense picks out there's no referent um for that for that sense to designate so right. that's how we're able to say that you know something doesn't exist we're not a you know attributing like a real property of non-existence that's what, that's what i was going to get to is right that this yeah. is this relates to a kind of another objection is that like hey if existence is a, a real property then non-existence would be too and that's absurd mm -hmm. but what you're saying i think this is the way i've always thought about it is that that's really just confusing a name's reference with his bearer right mm -hmm. like to say that that um the truth of thumper does not exist to say that that's true only requires that that thumper has a reference but to have a reference doesn't mean that the bearer exists now. Yeah. That that is not a... that is not demanded. So that that to yeah. me just seems like a confusion along those lines, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, so it, it doesn't mean that there there's a referent um for that uh reference. Um and and I think that you know that this comes out of embracing a more Kantian view um about the mind world relationship mm -hmm. that um you know that the mind world relationship is one of intentionality. Um not one of a uh, sort of representation. The mind-world relationship is one of representation. It always seems that, you know, in order for our thoughts to be true, 
we have to have a referent for each of our uh, representings. And if we don't have a referent for our representings, whatever we say about um, our representings will always be false, including yeah. saying that's, you know, what doesn't exist doesn't exist. Yeah, right. Excellent. Okay. So gentle listeners, please keep your questions and comments and objections coming because I want to, and Gavin, grab any that you think are relevant as we move along, but I, I do want to keep moving forward on the objections that I assembled beforehand as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, good. Uh, I'm seeing some cool ones there. So um, somebody's just asked, has Gavin read Joe Schmidt's new book on existential inertia and how it undermines uh, Aquinas's De Ante argument and Fieser's Five Proofs. Um, I'll take that charitably that, you know, I, you know, it attempts to undermine it so that it's not a foregone conclusion there. Um, so Joe very kindly uh, sent me a copy of the manuscript of the book. Um, it, it's not a going concern for me at the minute because um, of other projects that I'm working on. Um, but I do know someone who is working on a lengthy study of it, and I'm in collaboration um, with this person at the minute who's working on a lengthy study and uh, treatment of it. So um, to that extent, I'm engaged with it, but I haven't been working on publications on the existence of God or this kind of a metaphysics at the minute. I've been working on something else. When I get back to working on those sorts of publications, um, I'll give it a read and see, you know, if um, there's anything I need to deal with, anything I find particularly threatening and, you know, would, would need some sort of treatment. Um, until, until I swing back around to that, um uh, i haven't get a, given it a full you know uh, haven't given it my full attention just yet good well we do have uh, uh existential inertia on the list later so we will return to that <laughs> theme in in a minute uh, so all right let's let's keep storming ahead great answers gavin uh and again i said these are not kindergarten objections we're trying to deal with the real serious stuff here okay so Let's talk about ontological pluralism. You know, people want to say, hey, look, Aquinas is committed to modes of being. He's committed to ontological pluralism. But what about arguments for a monistic conception that mm. everything enjoys the same way of being? There's philosophers that hold that. Obviously, yeah. there's different motivations for it. And mm. yeah, wouldn't that just undermine all of Aquinas' system, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, that, this view, you know, would entail that, you know, being is univocal. Um, the university of being that the, you know, uh, what seems like ontological plural, pluralism is just simply, you know, monism. There's, there's only one way that thing, you know, things could be, there's only one way that a being could be, um, uh, there, there's no other way in which beings could be, and there's no other ways, uh, in which we could reference, um, beings. Uh, and that just seems to be straight up problematic because that means that, um, being cannot be diversified um, in any way because if um, being is univocal, then it has to be diversified from something other than itself, which would be non-being. But non-being is precisely non-being, um, so it can't diversify being. So we have to either say with Parmenides that everything is just swallowed up into being and diversity and all of that and change is all just an illusion or we grant the reality of diversity and try to give an account for that. And that's, you know, where the analogy of being comes in that, you know, being isn't this, you know, univocal monistic notion, but it's more of an analogical notion where, whereby when we speak about uh, the being of things, we, we talk about the being of things uh, in different ways. And this actually kind of relates to the sort of point that Adam's following up with there in the conversation, because you know, Adam, Adam's sort of asking about, you know, uh, the, the idea of being. Does the idea of being, you know, encompass both sides of the dichotomy of structure? You're now positing. So so he's suggesting that I'm positing a structure of existent, non-existent. No, I'm not positing that sort of dichotomy. I don't think non, I don't think non-existence exists. They don't enjoy being in any way. All that exists are existence. But we can intend through, you know, our propositional content to refer to non-existence. Obviously, we will not refer successfully to them because there's no existent there to refer to. But um, we can intend to refer to anything that we can think of. Um, uh, and it's in that ability to being able to refer to anything that we can think of, whereby we can say that such doesn't exist there's nothing you know which uh you know grants the truth of that uh reference um and that's that's what the analogy of being allows us to do the university of being says that we that if we affirm that existence is a property of things we have to affirm that non-existence is a property of things as well but the analogy of being doesn't 
um, hold that because the analogy of being allows us to refer to anything to which we intend to refer and then we just figure out whether you know it, it exists or doesn't yeah uh if people want an, a nice little independent uh <clears throat> argument for ontological pluralism and modes of being check out the work by bill valicella he, he he wants to argue that modes of being ontological pluralism is is indispensable for <clears throat> philosophy at the end of the day um but i don't know if you want to say anything more about that gavin go ahead otherwise we can keep storming um around. i suppose uh i suppose what i would want to say there is analogical thinking is indispensable for philosophy um so insofar as analogical thinking um enables modes of being then you know we need to re reject monism university mm -hmm. i see adams coming up there you know um again so there could be nothing to refer to you cannot oh right so if you're referring to non-existence, but non-existence does not enjoy any sort of ontological presence, then how can you prefer, be referring to it? You're not referring to non-existence, okay? Your your sense determines your reference. So my so the sense of the proposition is the intentional content, what I intend to refer to, and that determines uh, the reference. But it doesn't mean that there's a referent. You're referring to what the sense designates, and the sense can designate anything that you imagine. Black hole at the center of the galaxy or whatever. So, I mean, all this turns on whether or not sense determines reference. What you're referring to is what the sense designates. So it's not non-existence that, uh, that you're referring to. You're referring to what, what you're intending to refer to. But that doesn't mean that there's an, there's an existent, a referent. That doesn't mean that the reference is successful. So, Good. so you're you're not referring to non-existence. Uh, Adam says, "I will show my cards. I believe Parmenides and the Iliadics are right, and that reality is one big, perfect, complete being." All right, so he just goes right for the <laughs> for the paradoxes and embraces yeah. the Parmenideanism. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Cool. So, well, I mean, obviously, I mean, and, and that brings us back to university and mm -hmm. analogy, because I mean, that would be you know, univocal conception of being, and you know, I mean. Adam, you know, if, if I can speak for Adam and if I've got Adam wrong, you know, please tell me. But Adam would be being consistent there that, you know, there's nothing that could, you know, differentiate, you know, being except non-being. But non-being is nothing. So there is no differentiation of being. Um, so, I mean, so th this issue more than just kind of, you know, the, these Phrygian issues, you know, of sense and reference, this is going to boil down to analogy and plurivocity of being, whether being is a plurivocal or analogical notion. Yeah. Mm hmm Good. Okay. Well, we'll circle back to the comment section here in a minute. Uh, great discussion as always, guys. But uh, like I said, I got some stuff geared up here that I want to make sure that we get through. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Here's the active existence, infinite regress objection. And I th yeah. first saw this uh, uh, suggested by Proust. Uh, Coons records it in his classical theism volume, and I've seen it uh, discussed a little bit more online. It goes like this. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, Proust suggested this objection, but I want to make it clear he does not endorse it. So sure. just, just yeah. to make sure people are clear about this, Proust doesn't reject Thomism because of it. He just thinks it's an interesting thing to think about. So it goes like this. Aquinas' argument relies on his theory concerning acts of existence, but wouldn't this lead to a vicious regress? Now, quoting Proust, active existence can't explain the difference between actuality and mere potentiality because it was only actually existent acts of existence that can do this. But then we would need an explanation of the difference between actual acts of existence and merely possible ones. And so the former would need their own active existence and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. You yeah. get the idea. All right. Yeah. Yeah. What exists are individual things. The components of those individual things, they don't exist. And what I mean is they don't have acts of existence. It's the individual thing that enjoys the act of existence. It's not its components. The components are real or in existence because they are components of a thing that exists. And that goes for the act of existence as well. The act of existence doesn't have an act of existence because it's not a thing that exists. It's that which enables a thing to exist. Proust's objection entails that, uh, or envisages that the act of existence in order to do its work, would need some sort of active existence. But on Thomas's metaphysics, um, that active existence isn't a thing. It, it is only things that exist. If the active existence had an active existence, then you would have the active existence as a thing. But that's not what it's doing yeah. uh, in the substance. It's enabling the substance um, to exist. Uh, and so uh, in being such and not being a thing, it doesn't require an active existence.
Okay. okay. I would also point out that this term uh, possibility here introduces to confusion, introduces some sort of confusion. There are no possible acts of existence. <laughs> there are just there, there are no possible acts of existence waiting in the wing uh, to be united with an essence. Mm -hmm. All right. There are only existing things other than existing things. There is nothing. All right. So so there isn't this realm of possibility, and this is something that comes up, you know, in the history of philosophy, Scotus, Avicenna, and stuff. Um, there is no realm of possibility from which we pluck essence and pluck existence. That's actually a position that Thomas explicitly rejected um, when he's dealing with Avicenna in Commentary of Metaphysics, Book 4. Um, <clears throat> rather, um, other than existence, there is nothing. So we have existing things. We analyze their components, metaphysical component parts, the most fundamental of which are essence um, and existence. And uh, it's the act of existence... Um, by which the thing, the substance that exists, is something rather than nothing. But the act of existence isn't something rather than nothing because it's not a something. It's a mm, component mm -hmm. of a something. Mm -hmm. Ah, the subtlety of metaphysics. You got to love it. No, that's really great, Gavin. And sorry, I'm, I'm engaging in, in the comments and trying to listen at the same time. So excuse me if I, I appear slightly distracted, but we've got a lot of great discussion going in the comments. Let me say, again, keep it coming, guys. We'll try and... Uh, Gavin's... Uh, is free to pull up anything he wants along the way, but otherwise I'm just going to save your guys' questions and stuff for the end as we keep moving through these objections. Okay, so those mm. were just some uh, objections that were kind of aimed at the background metaphysics, Aquinas' theory of existence and uh, being and all that. So let's get on to uh, objections against, um, yeah, probably the, to my mind, the most interesting part of the Deante, mm. which is the multiplicity argument for the real yeah. distinction. Yeah. Now, um, Gavin, I'm going to have you restate this argument here in a minute. Uh, I, I will just say it is a, obviously a, a point of uh, debate among Thomas of where the real distinction is established in Deante. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some people think it's established at a prior point. You think it is established at this point. Uh, yeah. So, And since we're focusing on your presentation mm -hmm. and your defense, that's what we're interested in here. So why don't you go ahead and remind us what is Aquinas up to with this multiplicity argument, and then we'll consider some of the objections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I mean, the disagreement is a really just niche disagreement uh, in Thomistic scholarship. It's one of those really, really sort of niche disagreements that, you know, for non-specialists isn't a big deal. It's just for, for us specialists wanting to try and figure out what the mind of Thomas was here. And that's just, just where in the argument does he establish real distinction? We all agree that he does. He does it somewhere. Uh, we just disagree on exactly where, so it's that kind of disagreement. Um, so it's not a disagreement over whether there is a real distinction or anything like that. So, so as the gentle listeners don't think that that's what's happening, but it's just, um, you know, really just what, where does it happen? Uh, so it's really just to get to know the mind of the historical Thomas on this. But to get to know Thomism on this then, so I argue, uh, along with John Whipple, that real distinction occurs with the multiplication argument. And the general gist of the multiplication argument is that... Um, if you consider the hypothesis of something whose essence is identical to its existence, um, it could only be one and unique because there could be no principle by which it could be multiplied. Because anything other than it, which isn't an effect of it, is nothing. So there's nothing then which could plurify it or multiply it in any way, the way a genus is multiplied into a species, species into an individual or whatever, because it's not subject to anything other than it. Anything other than it is an effect of it and no cause is caused by the effect in the same manner that it is the cause of that effect. Um, <clears throat> that being the case, then, if something whose essence is identical to its uh, existence um, is one and unique, then anything which isn't one and unique, then anything which is multiple or multipliable is not something in which essence and existence are identical. So if we've got real multiplicity, which we do, you know, we're realists. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm a realist. Thomas is a realist, and I will defend realism. Um, uh, if we've got real, you know, multiples, then those are not that one unique thing whose essence is its existence, regardless of whether that exists. Yeah. Um, and so we have distinction of essence and existence in these real things, hence real distinction. Great. So given, I, yeah, no, go ahead, finish your thought. Yep. So, mm -hmm. so just to point out on that, I just saw that Samuel um, up above, Samuel Bostock just brought up something just, yeah, about that way of describing uh, the real distinction. So um, the way I'm describing the essence-existence distinction makes it sound like a Scotist formal distinction, 
not two-way separability in the given individual. So that when we say essence and existence are really distinct in these individual multiple things, um, we're saying that they're not identical in the thing. They're distinct metaphysical components, but that doesn't mean they're separate mm -hmm. metaphysical components of the thing. Um, so they're not separate the way the sun and the moon um, are separate components of the solar system. Rather, they're non-identical uh, to each other um, in the unit, which is the existing thing. So does that sound like a SCOTUS formal distinction? I mean, I, I think we, we, talk, we talked about this with uh, Tom Ward, didn't we? I was um, just going to say, please yeah. go visit our conversation with Dr. Tom Ward. I think we, uh, I think we kind of said they might be yeah. talking about the same thing here, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The SCOTUS has a different label for that kind of real distinction, but not separation. Thomas just calls that a real distinction, and the Tom and I, we kind of, as memory serves, we did come to the conclusion that you know, well, and the way Tom is reading SCOTUS here, well, that's what SCOTUS is formal. Um, distinction is so there's no there's just a disagreement of label there that's right that, and i think that's i think that's correct i say that as somebody who's definitely not a scotus scholar but it seems like the good scotus scholars uh like tom uh say that that's right so all right so given if there was a being who was just its existence uh, being a pure existence it would be simple and subsistent um and given the nature of multiplication it can't be multiplied because that would violate its nature as simple and subsistent right something like mm -hmm. that right okay yeah. Uh, so great. All right. Objections time. What do we have here? Okay. Well, uh, yeah. So what about this, Gavin? Maybe there's something outside of pure being, which could differentiate it. Namely another instance of pure being, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, in that case, if there's something outside of pure being, which isn't an effect of, you know, pure existence itself, well, then it's nothing because it's outside of pure existence. So there's nothing outside of pure existence that differentiated anything outside of it is an effect effect of it and stands as subject to it. Yeah, it's important that some because so, you know some of these objections, uh, like I said, I've I've pulled in the literature and some of them I've pulled from from people that that sent in that to um yeah to really get clarity about what we're thinking about and not just kind of let your imagination run wild. You mm. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. it's very easy to do when it comes to metaphysics to engage in picture thinking and kind of wind up in a tunnel of confusions rather than making sure you really have conceptual clarity of what's going on. Maybe you want to say a few things about that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And well, just to emphasize that that's what we're doing here. We're not doing meta. We're not doing, we are doing metaphysics. We're doing metaphysics here. We're not doing apologetics. We're not doing, you know, just quick, easy argument to get to a conclusion. Gotcha. We're done. We are doing metaphysics. And given the whole metaphysical framework and buttressing, we're led to these sorts of conclusions. So usually, I mean, as, as we've already been seeing with these objections, you know, what have we taken in? We've taken in Heraclitus, Parmenides, the problem of the one and the many, you know, through Adam there. We've taken in realism. Uh, I suppose we're going to take in nominalism later. Analogy, university. <laughs> I mean, it's the whole span of metaphysics uh, that we're taking in there. And so th this kind of argumentation can only be engaged in if we engage with the whole breadth yeah. of Aquinas' metaphysical thought, because that's what it encompasses. There yeah. are no gotcha moments in any of this. There's just kind of this cold, hard back and flow of metaphysical reasoning. The kind of thing that Tom Ward and I kind of engaged in in a few weeks back, where it kind of really got sort of deep into the weeds of, you know, these... Uh, distinctions and moves that can be made in the discussions. Yeah. And I think that's worth emphasizing. And I think that's worth pursuing because we're just trying to make sense of the whole. Right. And mm -hmm. that's what attracted me so much to Thomism is it just seems like a, a great big picture that gives mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a very fruitful theory that allow it like it allows you to affirm a lot of what I think many people would call common sense. Right. Mm -hmm. But the sophisticated machinery is very sophisticated that allows mm -hmm. you to do that underneath. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's keep going on. So Gavin, why can't there just be two instances of pure being that are just primitively distinct? Yeah. Right? Why, why must we search for some principle of individuation? Maybe it's just purely primitive that there is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In order for there to be multiplicity. Okay. There has to be some sort of principle uh, of multi by which that multiplication can occur. So, um, there is some reality that can be multiplied into its instances. So you have, say, two instances of this reality. Well, there's something that multiplies that reality 
into those instances. There's a principle of multiplication there that the reality is subject to by which it's multiplied. And this is something that's impossible for pure essay. This is what uh, the, the argument from the Ante 4 uh, points out, that anything other than pure essay, which isn't an effect of it, is nothing. So there's nothing um, which can multiply it. Um, there's nothing independent of it uh, to which it stands as subject uh, to, to multiply it as pure act. There's no distinction in it between the individual that it is and its nature whereas in things which are multiple there's a nature which is multiplied in them and hence you have you know more than one um because they're distinct from the nature but you know pure essay is pure act no, no distinction between individual and its nature because then you would still have it subject to something other than itself yeah you know that's that's a that's a fantastic response and uh, I don't want to ruin it with my own comments, but uh, I, Barry Miller actually has a really excellent article. I think it was from the 70s. It's an older one. And he, he approaches a little bit differently, but I, I found that it was very helpful when I was writing my own book as, as a research article. Um, because he, when he thinks of subsistent existence, uh, he thinks that, um, uh, well, when he thinks when it comes to God language, we shouldn't say that God exists because that entails ontological complexity, he thinks. So he thinks when we speak of God, we should just say like exists with an exclamation point, <laughs> right? <laughs> like it's an ontologically, it's ontologically simple. So it'd be a logically simple proposition for him. Mm. But then yeah. if, if that's right, he, he has some cool moves because then he says that there's two instances of exists. Well, there's some difference between them. And he rejects mm. IOI. We'll talk about mm. IOI in a minute, right? Mm. Uh, but he says that uh, there's still there's still some difference between them, even trivially so, right? Even mm -hmm. trivially so, like even if all their properties, or whatever, are similar. Um, mm -hmm. uh, by the fact that there are just two instances, however, uh, mm -hmm. that would it would imply that the similarity between mm -hmm. the two instances be expressible in terms of qualities or properties, right? Mm -hmm. But and that such expressions are ontologically grounded, which means it's ontologically complex. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It contradicts the nature of the simple yeah. reality we're talking about. So he thinks you get a contradiction out yeah. of multiplication at the end of the day. Once you have a clear conception of mm -hmm. what a being of pure existence would be, it is contradictory straight mm -hmm. up to think that there could be more than one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think that's just, in line with Thomas's way of thinking about it? Yeah, yeah. Although, I mean, I would tend to go down the, the more formal semantics route, you know, how we refer, how, how we say that, you know, that, that God exists or the pure essay exists, you know, we can, we can invoke, you know, a kind of a, a a way of talking about that whereby when we say where we simply say you know it it is true to say something like that that god is or god exists and mm -hmm. you know given that you know that the kind of the is or exists there that we're talking about is the truth of the proposition um, which affirms his existence we're not kind of drawn into any sort of a ontological complexity there um ran santos has a really great question which just follows up uh the discussion there it'd be nice to maybe address that yeah so ryan says is it not question begging to just assume at this stage that the other existences are effects of pure essay yeah so it's not so much an assumption so i mean it, okay so it, it's brought into that uh, sort of discussion without defense but yeah okay so there's a there's a metaphysical defense of that that anything which is other than pure essay okay so is what is other than pure essay, pure essay itself, right? If no, then it's not pure essay, then it has an active existence. Essence and existence are distinct in it, in which case it's dependent for its existence on pure essay. That's where, you know, the argument takes us. But if it is, you know, pure essay itself, then we have two pure essays, in which case they're multiples of some sort of common nature, which is pure essay. There are two pure essays, which are multiples of a common nature, pure essay, which means in them, pure essay one and pure essay two, there's distinction of the individual and the nature that it instantiates, instantiates distinction. And of now we have composition and complexity. And nature. Mm -hmm. But if it's pure essay, pure actuality, this was sort of one of the sort of points that we were getting to at the end of the last discussion. If it's pure existence, pure actuality. There is no distinction in it between the individual that it is and its nature, because then it would be subject to its nature. So pure essay one and pure essay two, as being instances of pure essay, uh, would be subject to the nature pure essay. Mm -hmm. But then they wouldn't be pure essay then. Um, so uh, that that's kind of where that reasoning uh, goes there. Yeah. That um, whatever is other than pure essay um, is an effect of pure essay. Yeah, well, yeah, it's really brilliant. You know, it's it's amazing. Like, I'll, I'll admit, like the first time I uh, encountered a lot of Aquinas's arguments, I, I was intrigued. I thought they were kind of simple, but 
figured, yeah, they're probably not that robust. And then, well, look at me now, right? Like these things are <laughs> really, really are brilliant, right? Uh, and and the longer I've thought about it, and I know you're way ahead of me on this guy. You've been thinking, you know, along with Aquinas for many more years than I have. My appreciation for just how brilliant this man was just like continues to to deepen and deepen and deepen for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I, th I think you're right about that. Um, and yes, Aquinas, definitely, you know, my hero and all the rest. Um, but I think that, the, I mean, going back to the, the discussion that Tom Ward and I had, um, we, we can see what was coming out in that discussion that Scotus, I think, was just as brilliant um, oh, for sure. as well. Mm -hmm. the, the sort of distinctions and subtleties uh, and the moves that can be made, you get in somebody like Scotus as well. Um, the, these sorts of philosophers, they're not like, you know, um, they're not like some later philosophers who just aren't as subtle and aren't as all-encompassing in their thought. They might be brilliant at just pinpointing single issue or a single domain but they don't have this all-encompassing vision, which you do get in people like Scotus and Aquinas, and I would even say Occam, yeah. um, people like that. So, I mean, yes, I mean, I don't, I, I don't kind of want to hero worship Aquinas. Yeah. All these guys, you know, would be my philosophical heroes. System, um, system builders. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And I, yeah. I mean that in relation to the fact that, like many people, one of my first impressions of Aquinas when I was a young, much younger lad was like, some it might have been wikipedia at the time i don't remember like summary of the five ways quoted like completely extracted right yeah. <laughs> so of course like it didn't impress me that much right but it intrigued me it pulled me into want to mm. learn more and then you come to see what a what a profound system builder and you mm. know i would say the same thing of leibniz i don't sign on with leibniz's entire system but i think he's mm. utterly brilliant right um yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's keep going because we still have a good amount to get through. All right, <laughs> yeah. this relates to something I already said. Doesn't the multiplicity argument assume the identity of indiscernibles? And boy, isn't that a controversial principle? And that would be yeah. bad news, right? Yeah. So maybe talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've never understood um, why it's, it's thought that the multiplicity argument assumes the identity of indiscernibles. Because the multiplicity argument, it doesn't reason from the premise that if we have two instances of pure essay, they would be indiscernible and thus identical. It doesn't reason in that way that, you know, two instances of pure essay are indiscernible. Rather, reasons concerning what's required for multiplication, i.e. that you need a principle of multiplicity uh, and a distinction of nature and thing, uh, which instances the nature. So if we have two pure essays, pure essay one and pure essay two, then they're instances of the nature, pure essay. So you have distinction of individual and nature, but that can't be the case for pure essay because it's pure actuality. Um, so it's not subject to a nature. Um, so it, there, there, there's just no reasoning in the actual text um, that we have in front of us from Thomas that he's saying that, you know, look, if you have two, they would be indiscernible and thus identical um, and so and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, it, it's just not there. And... I mean, when I wrote about this and when I do write about it, I mean, I, I never use the you know identity of indiscernibles to defend that argument. Yeah, I so. think it's I think it's definitely correct that the argument does not uh, depend upon IOI, and it's also obviously true that that many people who are either Thomists themselves or Thomistic friendly, like Barry Miller, they out they outright reject IOI, right, <laughs> and still run multiplicity type arguments, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so I mean, that's just another metaphysical, logical, semantical issue, identity of indiscernibles, which is, you know, up for grabs and, you know, different sort of a metaphysical discussion, kind of one that I haven't got too motivated, you know, about, you know, can't, can't really find an awful lot of traction um, in those issues, but, you know, I've been aware of it, and I do know that, you know, Thomas has something to say about, you know, similar principles, but doesn't figure in this argument. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have to pursue it any further because it's. I think you're correct. It's just not relevant to this. All right, uh, here's the next objection. Okay, uh, Gavin, uh, I'm following mm -hmm. you so far on the multiplicity argument, but maybe there's a way that things could be multiplied that Aquinas hasn't considered. And sure. if that's the case, how do we know that this is really a demonstration or a deductive argument rather than relevant. just an inference to the best explanation, right? Sure, mm -hmm. yeah. So certainly when, when you read the De Ante, he says, well, look, here's a form of multiplication. Here's a form of multiplication. You know, these don't apply and thus multiplication doesn't apply. And of course, I mean, you're, you're sitting thinking, reading that. Well, that's that's a bit of an inductive generalization, isn't it? Maybe there are other uh, ways of multiplying that just haven't been included in that, you know, 
inductive inference. Um, the, the argument that I make in the book um, is that, uh, and this pertains to finding the real distinction in that second stage, is that if the first stage is conceptual, the first stage is dealing with conceptual distinctions, the second stage begins at the conceptual, the a priori level. Mm -hmm. So Thomas is not making an a posteriori point when considering multiplication. He's making an a priori point, and the types of multiplication he considers are just instances of that a priori. They're instances of what he takes to be the essence of multiplication. And the essence of multiplication, if you notice in those uh, types of multiplication that he considers and rejects, uh, the essence of multiplication is that you have a principle by which the thing is multiplied. There's some sort of pr principle of plurification or multiplication or by which something is multiplied. And if that's the essence of multiplication, then divorced from the types that he considers, that's the a priori rule for how you know things are multiplied. And so is that applicable to pure essay itself? Well, there is nothing other than pure essay itself, which is not an effect of pure essay itself, to which it stands as subject for multiplication. And so there is no principle per se of multiplication, which is applicable to pure essay. Okay. Excellent. Great. And that one you can read more about in your excellent book, Aquinas's Way to God and the Collected Articles volume, right? It's in both. Okay. Excellent. Hey, we got to make the plugs here. Gentle listeners, please support Gavin and the good work he is doing. I, I, I understand that the academic texts, Aquinas's Way to God, are a little bit pricey, but your Collected, your collected <coughs> Articles volume is very reasonably priced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's with Editionis Scholastic Guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's been kind of, you know, 10 years, 10, 10 years worth of... Uh, collected articles, in including the article which sort of started off this sort of engagement with this argument. Uh, it was an article that I, that I wrote on the Dante proof, and that kind of was the, you know, the springboard uh, yeah. for the book. It was actually a reviewer suggested, you know, you could get a book out of this. So well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> What a nice reviewer. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's uh, let's keep storming ahead. All right. Uh, so this one actually was kind of hinted at earlier. Nominalism, right? Hey, this uh -huh. argument is not going to be forceful against people who are who reject realism, right? And who yeah. are nominalists. So what do we want to yeah. say about that, Gavin? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So nominalism... in, fact, in fact, I want to give a shout out to our buddy, Kevin, because that's where he says his holdup is. He says he's not a realist. Sorry, I dropped the, the comment here. But yeah, so it's worth talking about this. Yep. Yes, yeah, I, I see it there from Kevin. He's not a realist. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so nominalism holds that our conceptual content that would that we entertain, um, we use it to represent the world, but the world that is thereby represented is not like that conceptual content. Conceptual content, you know, um, makes use of um, various uh, well universal uh, content. So, such as content which says, you know, that the world is thus and so. Um, there are types of things in the world. And nominalism denies that. That, you know, to talk about, you know, sort of universal types is simply talk of nomina uh, that we entertain in our thoughts, but is not applicable to the actual world. And the reason why they think that is that nominalism, and I'm thinking of Occam here, but, you know, this you can generalize this to other kinds of nominalism. Um Nominalism uh, kind of envisages a divorce between the content of perception and the content of understanding. Content of perception and the content of understanding, such that perception carry, carries with it a content which is heterogeneous from the content of understanding. Perceptual content is particular, individual, okay, related to sensible things. Um, the content of understanding is universal, conceptual, so unlike the content um, of perception. The problem with that, and I think this is a major problem, is that we typically take our perceptual experiences to justify our empirical beliefs. If we have an empirical belief, it's our perceptual experience which justifies that, okay? That, that our, our empirical beliefs are meant to cohere with the experiences um, from which those beliefs are a consequence. But if the content of experience perception is not conceptual, then perception cannot justify empirical beliefs. Why? Because justification is a rational relation. 
And nominalists put rational relations on the side of conceptual contents, which is not on the side of perception. Conceptual content is not in perception. It's on the side of intelligence. So we're in the odd situation that our empirical beliefs are not justified by our empirical experiences because empirical experiences don't have conceptual content and thus can't exhibit rational interconnections. So in order for just in order for um, empirical perceptual experiences to be able to justify empirical beliefs, we have to deny the perceptual experiences are devoid of conceptual content. In other words, we need to affirm the perceptual experience does have conceptual content and so can place a rational constraint on thought. Now, if perceptual experience can put a rational constraint on thought, the content of perception is the content of understanding. And what do we perceive? Objects in the world. So objects in the world that we perceive, the content of that perception being the content of understanding is conceptual content. So the content brought about in perception by those objects is a conceptual content as well. And so conceptual content goes all the way out to the world. So right. the world exhibits these intelligible interconnections, which we can in turn um, entertain by means of conceptual content drawn from perception. Otherwise, we can't say the perception justifies an empirical belief. Yes, and that would be a problem for a lot of people, right? <laughs> and um, it's, so it's conceptual content all the way down. Uh, mm. That's a, Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, approach there with uh, uh, coming mm. at nominalism. Another, I'll just throw out another one real quick for people who are interested in this debate. Lloyd Gerson's <clears throat> fairly recent debate, yeah. uh, mm. uh, not debate, book, um, Platonism um, and naturalism. I, I should forget the title. I've read this book so many times now, but I forget. It's his one on naturalism and Platonism. That is a heavy handed defense of realism and a, just an outright, I think, devastating attack on nominalism, too. Yeah. Um, that's the, the possibility of philosophy, mm -hmm. Platonism and naturalism, possibility of philosophy. Is that it? That's the one. Yep. That's exactly mm -hmm. the one. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's yeah. going to say that, yeah, philosophy is impossible. Impossible. Yeah from a nominalistic the, the, perspective, right? Mm -hmm. The sort of um, defense that I just gave there is drawn from John McDowell, no, yeah, Mind yeah, and yeah. World. I got um, a little bit of that flavor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's a very Kantian-inspired um, uh, defense of realism, but one that I think, you know, is, you know, consistent with yeah. Aquinas' position. And certainly, certainly McDowell uh, has come around, you know, to thinking favorably about Aquinas in recent years, so. Yeah, which is cool. But a lot of the issues with nominalism, I mean, the thing that really... Um, points me away from nominalism aside from common sense right and yeah. seemings if you want to talk that way is are these various self-defeat issues right and and right. skeptical scenarios that seem <laughs> seem to kind of result uh inescapably once you mm -hmm. um kind of yeah. take the nominalist starting point right mm -hmm. yeah um, kevin just brought up a point there and i, I appreciate kevin has to, he says he has to go and he's going to listen back um, so, I mean, we'll not spend too much time on this because Kevin can't bounce back to us at it, but he says, wouldn't this only prevent a nominalist from claiming absolute certainty about anything? The nominalist can still claim confidence, just not certainty. I suppose I would want to undercut that issue because um, if nominalism is unable to say that our perceptual experiences justify empirical beliefs, that, that's beyond the issue of certainty and confidence. That's really attacking the very nature of empirical beliefs. And so we're we're into an entire metaphysics of uh, the mind world relationship there, which I think um, because nominalism, you know, tends to do its metaphysics after the presupposition of nominalism, it can't do its metaphysics prior to establishing its nominalism. Uh, and so there, there's a presupposed metaphysics there, which given the nominalism, and it it can't defend. And so it's going to be hard for the nominalists to defend a mind, a metaphysics of the mind world relation whereby perceptual experience can't justify empirical beliefs, despite the fact that there's all sorts of empirical beliefs that the nominalists will have to deploy uh, yeah. in order to say something like that. Awesome. Great. Uh, what I love about this conversation, I, I, I told the gentle listeners that this would, this, this would be the, uh, the grown-up conversation, right? That we're going to get into the tall grass, but we're really exploring a wide range of important mm -hmm. and 
perennial metaphysical issues within yeah. the context of this argument, yeah. right? Yeah. That's fascinating. <laughs> and there's Parisa has just came up with another one. So I don't know, Pat, if we're going to get all the way through your chance. Yeah, let's let's yeah. put pause on that because like yeah. we we can just do a separate episode on realism and nominalism at some point, I guess. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um because yeah. because really I mean, you're, really your answer to this is hey, yeah, granted, it won't work on nominalism. But now we have reasons to really think that nominalism is false. That's a short answer to this objection, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so for Paritza, McDowell, mind and world, he addresses that issue, you know, of perceptions causing as opposed to justifying um, conceptual contents. So that's where I'm going to go with that, with <laughs> McDowell. So, yeah. So, yeah. so we don't get too far off on, on a tangent. And you know what? Next time we book Gavin, maybe we can make that the topic if people are interested enough in that. That would be that would yeah. that would be fine. All right. Um, okay, Gavin, why can't there be beings who are just identical to their own existence rather than just existence itself? What's wrong with, with that? What's wrong with there be multiple beings who are identical to just their existence? Yeah. So if we have individuated existence, so we have a being, the suggestion is we have a being identical to its own existence. Its existence is individuated. If it's individuated, it's individuated to the essence, okay, that it actuates. All right, so it's that essence that it actuates. So the act of existence is actuating that essence and not another. If it's actuating that essence, it's not identical to the existence to the essence it is actuating. The essence is standing to that act of existence as potency to act, and so in actuating that essence, uh, there's a distinction there between the two. So if you have individuated existence, as this objection states, identic, why can't you just have a being which is identical to its own existence? Its own existence is individuated, actuating its essence, that essence and no other, in which case you have distinction of essence and existence. Yeah. That's, why you, that's why you can't have that. That's a great response, and it kind of sidesteps the next objection, because sometimes people will say in response to that objection, well, then that would seem to demand that this thing is a necessary being, but you didn't take that route, so I don't think that that's... Um, mm -hmm. But suppose somebody did take that, well, somebody might say, well, okay, well, maybe it doesn't have to be a necessary being. Maybe it's identical to existence insofar as its existence is just... It's existing from T1 to T2 or something like that. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah so it would be a similar answer, the CM answer, just to, with the addition... Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that it's not identical to its existence, T1 to T2. Its existence is actuating it mm -hmm. um, to exist, or to be is actuating the thing to be um, yeah. from T1 to T2 to Tn or whatever. Right, that's fantastic. Okay, that concludes the selection of objections on the multiplicity argument. And dang, yeah, I think it holds up. I, those are really, really good responses, Gavin. Thank you for that. So we're going to... Move on to attacks on the other steps of the argument. Uh, so let's consider Edward's objection. Uh, now we're going to talk about causal regresses and stuff like that. So let me just yeah. uh, quote it, Gavin, and you can fill in the details and respond. Mm -hmm. So one can deny the uncaused nature of the first cause without thereby denying its existence, in which case yeah. the believer in an infinite series is not committed to the denial of the existence of a first cause, in which case there presumably can exist a first cause in a series of essentially ordered causes that one accounts for the causal efficacy of the series, but two is not on cause. So fill in whatever context you think is needed around that, any additional context, yeah. and then your response. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I first started working on per se ordered series, it was in that um, article on the De Ante, which is in the collected articles book. And mm -hmm. it was in order to kind of, you know, see how Thomas terminates the regress. And so I started going through the metaphysics of per se ordered series. But um, I came across Edwards' objection, and as memory serves me, I do talk about it in that article. But after after I published that article on the De Ante, I wanted to just look at Edwards' objection in relation to the metaphysics of per se ordered series. And so my first paper on per se ordered series, essentially ordered series reconsidered, the, the motivation for that was to address Edwards' that, objection yeah. here. Mm -hmm. So the objection is that Edwards is pointing out, look, in those who deny, right, um, a first cause. We're not saying that a first cause doesn't exist. We're just denying its exalted status. So yes, you do have a primary cause in per se ordered series. It's just not uncaused. So you can see how that kind of subtly would get at, you know, kind of, you know, arguments for God. They're saying, yes, there is a primary cause of per se ordered series. It's just not uncaused, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. which case it's not God. Well, so my whole engagement here was that um, 
primary causes in per se ordered series are uncaused with respect to the causality of the series. That's what makes them the primary cause of a per se ordered series. The mental agent originates the, mo the motion in the hand, stick, and stone, but the mental agent's motion is itself not originated in it. As a mental agent, it can just do that. Fire originates the heat in, say, the pot and the contents of the pot, but fire's heat, the heatness of the fire, is not something originated in, in it. It's just something that fire does. Now, Edwards is totally correct to point out that fire itself is originated, maybe not with respect to heat, but with respect to something else. And the mental agent definitely is originated, maybe not with respect to motion, but with respect to something else. Now, here's the point, here's the argument that I made. Um, the primary cause in per se ordered series, it's uncaused with respect to the causality of the series. Edward's point follows when the sort of causality with respect to which it is uncaused is non-absolute causality. Motion, heat, whatever else, that's non-absolute causality. Things can still be without motion or without heat. So the primary cause of motion for the hand, stick, and stone um, might be primary and thus uncaused with respect to the motion, but it's not absolutely uncaused so because there's some other cause of it. And the fire may be the primary cause of heat in the pot and the contents, but and so it's uncaused with, re with regard to that causality, but it may be caused with regard to a different causality. Somebody starts the fire. The the point that Thomas is making when considering per se ordered series is that the kind of causality we're considering with regard to God's existence is an absolute causality without which there would be nothing, i.e. the causality of existence. The causality of existence is such that if something doesn't have it, it's nothing. That's not like the causality of motion, like the hand sticking stone with their motion. They can be without it and still be. So the primary cause of it, uncaused with regard to motion, but could still be caused in some other respect. Primary cause of existence, okay, in per se ordered series, is the primary cause of an absolute causality without which there is nothing. So that if it is the primary cause and uncaused with respect of it, it is absolutely uncaused because there is nothing other than it which could be the cause of it. Yeah. And that, that was my argument against Edwards' position in God. When, I think it was 2012 I might have yeah. published that well, article. It holds uh, up. I think it is a decisive response, right? So considering absolute causality, if there's a primary cause of that, then it is absolutely uncaused, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that's the argument that I made um, in that paper. And so I am still stand by that argument because what per se causal series are considering are, is causality. And the primary cause is uncaused with respect to that causality. And if it's an absolute causality, then it's absolutely uncaused. Yeah. Good. Very good. All right. Let's uh let's go to our let's go to David Hume. Let's go to David oh, Hume. Sure. Yeah, yep. let's cool. Let me quote Hume's uh people will probably recognize this passage. It's pretty well known, at least in the literature concerning calls arguments for God and infinite regresses and all that. So Hume's quote is this, did I show you a particular cause of each individual in a collection of 20 particles of matter? I should then think it very unreasonable that you should afterwards ask me what was the cause of the whole 20, right? This is sufficiently explained in explaining the cause of the parts. Now I've seen this objection kind of situated in different places when it comes to causal arguments for God, situate it where you think it's most relevant as mm. an objection to Deante Gavin, and then uh, yeah. go ahead and issue your response. Mm -hmm. So this kind of, um, what, what Hume is uh, attacking is a sort of view that says, look, you know, we have, you know, this series, he has the 20 particles of matter, and he thinks, well, look, each particle of matter um, is accounted for um, by accounting for that particle in itself. We don't need to account for the whole all we need to do is account for each of the individual members. And so the way this sort of comes up when talking about causal series is, uh, well, Bertrand Russell famously said that, you know, we can account for each member of the causal series by saying that each member individually has a cause and the immediately preceding member. Um, 
but we need not think that there's a cause for the series as a whole. So just because every man has a mother doesn't mean that there's a mother for all men. And he's absolutely right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. The sort of series that Hume is thinking about here and that Russell is thinking about here is the per accidents, accidentally ordered series. In accidentally ordered series, the members of the series possess the causality in themselves in virtue of what they are. So, so long as each member of the series has immediately succeeding member, which brings it about, the series needs no other explanation than its individual members. And in fact, that's what Thomas says. That series could go to infinity. No mm -hmm. problem. Well, it's potentially infinite. It's actually finite, but potentially infinite. There's no issue there. Completely consistent with Aquinas' views, and I just think with good metaphysical thinking. The problem is Hume and Russell, um, they don't consider per se ordered series. Series is in which the members do not possess the causality of the series in virtue of what they are, in which case the members, not the members as a whole taken as a composite, but each of the members has its causality through another, not through an immediately preceding member, but through some other which originates the causality of the members of the series. They participate in that causality in the way that the hand, stick, and stone participate in the causality that the mental agent grants to them. That's the sort of series that Hume doesn't consider, and that's the sort of series that Hume's objection, um, you know, just comes up against. Yeah, so one thing that I always really loved about the Thomistic approach is I think it is uniquely situated uh, to strongly overcome those types of challenges, like uniquely situated. Now, there's other cosmological reasoners who are maybe more like Nitzian, take Alex Bruce, I think he's done brilliant work, right? Um, and I think I think they have their own kind of good responses to Hume. Oh, look, we can make use of plural quantification if we're looking for an explanation of fact. We want the fact of why there's anything of the type contingent at all, and any one contingent thing is obviously posterior to that fact. So to avoid circularity, right, we got to get it necessary. I actually think those responses are pretty good. But there's something about Aquinas's approach and having that background metaphysics and essentially ordered causal series and understanding of that. Uh, that just totally makes these types of object objections a, a, a non-threat, a non-concern. Uh, yeah. Specifically, the Thomistic approach has always felt to me the most powerful way to kind of plow through these human type objections. And maybe that's a bias, but I don't think it is. I think that's part of the reason yeah. why I've gone to mystic so much I have. Like, mm -hmm. I just think it's just the most powerful for dealing with what are, I think, some of the most interesting and challenging objections to cosmological type reasoning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, here, um, and this bears on this. You know I do Kung Fu, right? Oh, so that's why I keep my distance over here in America. <laughs> <laughs> so Kung Fu, I mean, what do we want to be like when we do, do Kung Fu? We want to be like water. Mm -hmm. And what's water like? Okay, related to Kung Fu. Water takes the area, the, the path of least resistance to get to its destination. Mm -hmm. That's what water does. Mm -hmm. The path of least resistance to get to its destination. And that's what Aquinas' metaphysics does. The path of least uh, resistance, the most piercingly straightforward path to get to its destination. And in this case, we got a metaphysics there. Hume raises an objection outside of that metaphysics. As Thomists who have defended that metaphysics, just, you know, divide and conquer. Hume, your objection applies um, and, and, and is only in relation to per accidents ordered series. We're not considering that. We're considering the per se ordered series. Our Kung Fu is stronger. Um, beautiful done <laughs> i love it by the way have you ever seen the movie sidekicks no okay so neither have i um but right. my uh it, it's chuck norris and my oh, well, must be good. well yeah and my wife's cousin jonathan brandis he passed away sadly but he's in it too so we were gonna we're gonna watch it right. uh, probably this weekend mm. and uh i know you're into martial arts movies so i wasn't sure if you've seen it or not totally unrelated to this conversation but okay i'll let you guys know how it is yeah uh -huh. right. All Ex right existential inertia is next gavin we've right. been through this one many many times so um we'll go have ahead to. And, and state right. whatever you want to state about it yep mm -hmm. okay so with the proviso that um i do have a copy of uh joe's book um it's uh, because i've been working on other stuff it's it's not been a going concern when i swing back to publishing on some of this stuff I'll go through it and um, see if there's anything that kind of, you know, needs to be included, needs to be done. I do know somebody who, you know, is working quite in depth 
you know, on a lengthy sort of a treatment of the book. And I'm kind of, you know, engaged with this person. Um, so, but so with that um, sort of, you know, proviso, um, the general strategy um, I take against existential inertia, indeed, will be the, the strategy, you know, I'll be having in mind uh, when engaging with the book is that inertial properties, okay, are such that they subsist in something. Okay, that's what inertial properties do. They subsist in something, hence their inertial nature, hence their remaining, because the thing in which they subsist remains. So that's what inertial properties do. And the common example, which, you know, has been used in the literature in the past is uh, color properties that, you know, a thing has the color property that it does because that property is caused in it. And so long as there are no sort of competing causal influences, it will remain until another causal influence comes along to change the color. Now, the reason why that remains is because that property subsists in the thing of which it is the color. Um, so that's a common feature of inertial properties. And, it, and in my article on existential inertia and in my article uh, on the first way where I, I again take up the existential inertia issue, um, that's the common sort of metaphysical thread which um, runs through those objections. Now, with regard to existence, um, so we're thinking, you know, existence is a property of things. The suggestion is that it is an inertial property, that it is added to the thing and that it simply remains in the thing until something comes to sort of, you know, knock it out, mm -hmm. knock it out. But then that presupposes that, you know, existence is in the thing in the way that, you know, other sort of, you know, inertial properties are in their things. Uh, but those other inertial properties presuppose the things that they're in, whereas existence doesn't presuppose the thing that it's in. The thing presupposes existence because the thing uh, is subject to distinction of essence and existence, and so the thing participates in existence. So for as long as the thing participates in existence, you have the thing, okay? So the thing exists so long as it participates in existence, which means that the existence is not inertial, okay? Existence is what's keeping the thing going in existence, but existence is not sort of subsisting in the thing and just remaining with it. So that's the general thread of the reasoning against existential inertia um, that I adopt uh, with the proviso that, you know, when I get back around to writing about this stuff, you know, after my other projects, um, I'll be engaging with Joe's book um, after that. But that, that'll be the sort of uh, the thinking that I'll be deploying um, when engaging with it. So we have we have a little uh, uh, th what do you call them on YouTube? Is it short or real? I, I, I it's a mm. short on YouTube. But it's a real, I guess, on Instagram. Social media is yeah. confusing of a uh, of a uh, of another of some of your other thoughts on on that objection as well. I encourage people to check it out. Uh, for now, we have three more, Gavin, three more. We're almost <laughs> done. And now we're heading towards attacks on uh, the conclusion on the sure. on the kind of. Aquinas's philosophy of God, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's incoherent. Maybe it entails other problematic results. So let's uh, mm -hmm. let's consider these. All right, here's the first one. Okay, so Aquinas is talking about subsistent existence, but does it make any sense to say that something is identical to existence? Isn't that like saying that something is identical to blackness? That just sounds like nonsense. Gavin, what is your response to this? Yeah, what what where does Aquinas say that something is identical to existence? Oh my God. Uh, Curiously, that's there's I'm... no re there's no reference. <laughs> <this subject. laughs> yeah, that's what I'm asking. So, um, as I understand, Thomas. Um, un unless he, depo uh, he deploys a façon de parler, okay, just a way of speak where that would come up here and there. Um, Aquinas' thinking is not saying that there is something which is identical to existence, but that there's something whose essence is its existence. Its essence is its existence. So it's the same with blackness. When we talk about blackness, we're not saying that there's a thing, unless we're Platonists, we're not saying that there's a thing that's identical to blackness, because then you have a distinction of the thing, the individual, and the blackness to which, you know, it's in some way identical. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what we can say here is that there is an essence that is blackness, okay? There's something that it is to be black, and then it's an open question whether that essence simply obtains in itself, and that would be Platonism, or it's only found in the things that are black. 
and that would be Aristotelianism. Mm -hmm. In the current case, when it comes to essay subsistence or pure essay or pure existence, it's not a conceptual problem to speak of something whose essence is its existence, because then we're not saying we have a something and existence, and that something just happens to be identical to this existence. Rather, the question is, uh, you know, th there's not a conceptual problem in speaking of that, something whose essence is identical to its existence. Um, the pressing question is whether there is such a thing. In the same way with Platonism and Aristotelianism over blackness, we can talk about, you know, the essence of blackness and then ask whether, you know, uh, does that obtain in itself or in things? Um, we can ask about, you know, uh, a thing whose essence is its existence and ask, well, is there such a thing? And, and, and that's precisely what the proof for God's existence um, establishes. Well, yes, <laughs> there is such a thing. But conceptually speaking, there isn't a problem with speaking of something whose essence is identical to existence. Right. Like it doesn't seem to be a conceptual problem to say that Fido is not identical to his blackness. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. All right. Good. All right. Satisfied with that. So let's uh, keep going. All mm -hmm. right, this one's coming against divine simplicity, uh, because obviously that is a commitment of Thomas. Mm -hmm. And it says, look, um, this has uh, been a host of objections raised against it, but I guess the one that's being talked about now is it's it's incompatible with God's knowledge of contingent creation, right? Yeah. Uh, God obviously would have to change when he comes to know that he created the mm -hmm. world. He would acquire some some accident right some metaphysical accident or something like that so yeah. so so whatever aquinas's philosophy of god is it just it just can't be right unless we accept mm -hmm. like a modal collapse of some form or, or other right mm -hmm. yeah yeah this only follows if the conceptual content by which contingent creation is known is abstracted from that creation itself so if the conceptual content by which one knows contingent creation is drawn from contingent creation itself, then that conceptual content has to itself in some way enjoy the contingency um, of creation. Um, and that's the case for us. We abstract conceptual content from things, and so our conceptual content, um, in a manner, so I'll, I'll qualify this in a second, in a manner um, shares in that contingency. But this is this need not be the case if the conceptual content is not abstracted from that creation. So if the conceptual content by means of which we understand creation is not abstracted from creation. Um, so in God's case, the conceptual content by means of which he knows creation is not something drawn. It's not some sort of representative content from the creation itself. It's the divine essence. God, the divine essence is the lens through which God understands creation, not some sort of abstracted conceptual content. And so God, you know, understands all the features of creation simply through the lens of the divine essence, which is, you know, one, mutable, uh, eternal, and all the way, all, all the rest. So a lot of the confusion um, on this issue um, results um, from thinking that in order to have um, genuine conceptual content by means of which we can think about something, that that conceptual content um, has to be representational. But as, as has been coming up sort of earlier in the discussion, um, I'm not going to hold that the conceptual content as representational. It's intentional. Okay. It picks something out. Um, and so uh, the conceptual content that God has is the divine essence itself mm -hmm. capable of picking out anything which could possibly be. Um, and given that, you know, uh, that conceptual content, you know, is identical to God's power, uh, knows and can pick out um, what has occurred as a result of God's power. Uh, so, um, yeah, that, that, that's how I would, uh, first of all, address that. But right. I would also point out that it's even, even in the case of creaturely abstraction, when we abstract conceptual content from contingent things, even those abstracted conceptual contents need not themselves be contingent. Um, uh, the mode by which conceptual content is possessed is possessed according to the no mode of the knower and not in the same way in which that content is in the thing. For example, when we abstract mathematical concepts, those mathematical concepts are universal, but what are they abstracted from? Let's say in geometry, 
geometrical figures, they're abstracted from individual things, individual circles and squares and lines and all the rest, um, which when we abstract them, we pass over all the contingencies of you know those individual squares and circles and all the rest and entertain the universal notion. So even an abstracted conceptual content from contingent creation can itself be non-contingent, such as mathematical concepts. Mm-hmm. And look, I mean, if that's the case for us creatures, you know, and, and our intellects can do that, I mean, God's intellect can do the same. Mm-hmm. And, well, and more, obviously, because the intelligible species by which it understands um, is the divine essence. And maybe just to point out here, I'm just noticing that Jason Reed um, is sort of uh, commenting um, here in the discussion. Um, if that's the same Jason Reed... Is this um, the Jason Reed I'm talking to Thursday, your associate, Gavin? Is this the same Jason Reed that I met in New Orleans? He gave us a paper on this very issue, um, on the aloneness argument, which took in an awful lot of this issue. Just absolutely 100% knocked it out of the park. Amazing um, paper, which I hope gets, which I really do hope gets published. And uh, a lot of my thinking that I've been articulating here um, was, you know, Jason's sort of thinking at that session. It was a great session where Jason gave a presentation and several others on this and a nest of related themes. So, um, Jason, uh, further details on this. Well, I've, I've just published a paper on uh, the aloneness argument. Um, but uh, hopefully Jason's going to be publishing that paper as well. You know? Awesome. Awesome. Well, it is. It, it might be the Jason Reed and the Gavin made the connection. So, Jason, we're going to talk Thursday. We're hopping on the horn just to uh, jam and hopefully we'll be featuring him on the podcast and we can uh, dive a little bit deeper into that issue with uh, with the good professor there. Thanks for popping in, uh, Jason. Mm. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's all. That's all I had. So unless there's something mm. else you want to throw into the list, maybe we could spend a few minutes on and any other questions. I know you have an early morning tomorrow, so I don't want to keep you too long. Um, but yeah. that was great. Yeah, that was that was really good stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, as we were going through it, you know, I was seeing questions pop up, and you know, we we were engaging, you know, quite a bit as we were going through. Um, there's some, you know, other sort of niche, you know, sort of uh, other questions coming. Well, let up me grab there. this one real quick because I did promise Astrofire oh, I would pull yeah. this up. Astrofire yeah. wants to know what's wrong with Avicenna's conception of essay as an accident. Yeah. So this. Um, comes about as a result of uh, Avicenna's threefold consideration of essence. I was literally teaching this this morning. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is very so, convenient uh, timing with uh, your teaching schedule and the podcast topic. Yeah, it's great. So, yeah, it, it's half nine p.m. So twelve hours ago, my nine to eleven <laughs> class this morning, I was literally teaching this, um, and I was contrasting the, the way in which I was introducing Aquinas' account was to contrast it with Avicenna's. So it's quite fresh in my head. Um, Okay, so um, Avicenna's account comes from, from his threefold um, consideration of essence. You can have, uh, consider essence as it exists in the thing. So the tree has the essence of treeness. Essence as it exists in the mind. So the, the thought of a tree uh, and essence just as it is in itself, independently of mind and thing. So you can have the essence of a tree just as per se what treeness is, neither existing in the mind or in the thing. Okay. That essence as it is in itself doesn't enjoy actual existence. There's some mode of possible being to it, but it's not actual existence. It signifies a kind of possibility, but it doesn't have actual existence. And then in order for it to actually exist in the thing, it kind of needs to be topped up with actual existence. So it gets actual existence, making that the essence of an actually existing thing. Um, And that was a very appealing position that Thomas came up against. And we see repeated after Thomas's death that, you know, there is the being of essence, essay essentiae, and then there's the the kind of the fuller topped up being of existence, essay existentiae. And so just imagine all these possible essences existing in this sort of modal realm of possibility. And then they are actual by being given, you know, existence to top them up. What that means then, and now, now we can relate that to, you know, possible worlds, metaphysics and possible worlds, essentialism and all of that, um, you know, the completely the, the possible worlds, modal essentialism, I think is a reformulation of that Avicennian position. Now, the problem with that is that it makes essence, it makes possibility more fundamental than existence. 
existence is just a kind of mode of topping up what is already more fundamental, which is essence. And that's not, that's no surprise in Avicenna because um, he's you know that's this modal metaphysician, but it just it just makes possibility essence much more fundamental than actual existence. For Thomas, existence is the act of all acts. There is nothing, literally nothing, without the act of existence. So it's not that the act of existence is just coming along and topping up something more fundamental in it, some essence existing, you know, subsisting in this realm of possibility. There is nothing, <laughs> okay, other than existence. So we don't have a more fundamental, you know, mode of reality than existence. So it can't be the case that, you know, existence just comes along to essence and is an accident of it. And that's Thomas's, um, well, that, that informs Thomas's critique of Avicenna in Metaphysics, Book 4 and elsewhere. Excellent. Excellent. Boy, have we covered a lot of territory today. This might honestly go down as one of my favorite episodes. I mean, I love I love this stuff. I love just rolling up the sleeves, getting into the tall grass. I feel a little bad because the sh title of the show is Philosophy for the People. And mm -hmm. uh, I just feel bad for the for the poor random person who's just like looking for a basic philosophy channel and winds up on this conversation. All I'll say is forgive us. <laughs> there is some more basic content on this channel. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, I guess, yeah, this, we enjoy this stuff. We hope, we hope that it's helpful. We've got a lot of interest in natural theology and Thomism on this channel. So I really appreciate you, Gavin, taking the time to be here. And it shows a lot of not just your, you know, your own, if I may say so, brilliance and depth on on the subject, um, uh, but how up to date you stay on these things. I think that's just a really cool uh, thing to see. There's there are objections to Thomism. There's some really interesting ones, and we're just trying to do the intellectual honest work of facing them head on. And uh, yeah, so appreciate it, Gavin. Is there anything else you want to say about anything we've covered so far today? If not, then make sure you mention your books one more time before we and any other projects you're working on and want to just tease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's all been you know good crack and you know look we've got a lot of questions come up and I'm still seeing questions come in. You know, could be here all night. You know, if you want to take a few more, go for it. But I just don't want to keep you here all night because I know you've got a very busy schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's getting late. I'm going to be tucked up in bed. You know, saying I'm yeah. I'm teaching ethics. Uh, in the morning, life and death issues and ethics. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'll, I need to be up for that. So, I mean, I'm happy to call it a night here, but I mean, just to point out, you know, this, this sort of back and forth, this, this is the kind of back and forth that Tom Ward um, and I were having. We are teasing out these sorts of questions, you know, which kind of go deep into metaphysics. And we're trying to, you know, sort of get some resolution to them. I know the gentle listeners are kind of, they're, they're kind of typing in questions and, you know, they're sort of getting answers, but, you know, maybe there can't be as much back and forth as, say, Tom and I had. But if the gentle listeners were here sitting with us, you know, we would be able to have that back and forth. And, and look, I mean, that's that's the scholastic way of doing things. That's Aquinas's way of doing things. It, it's never a gotcha moment. It's kind of like, right, I, I see your point. I see where that's coming from. This is how I think it can be accommodated within this metaphysics, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that we've been laying out. So again, it's a, it's an overarching systematic um, approach to philosophy, um, which has is, is always been uh, my approach to philosophy. So so I'm, I'm glad that, you know, uh, we're able to do this. With regard to projects, um, let me see. Um, God, I've, I've always got projects on. <laughs> I've I got like half a dozen writing projects I, I'm doing at the minute. You, you probably sort of, you know, discerned when I was saying just in, in reaction to the question about Joe's book. I'm, I'm, I'm currently, I don't have any writing project on which takes in that issue, which means all my writing projects at the minute are on different issues. And, you know, you've probably discerned, um, I've been going on a lot about epistemological mind world issues at the minute. I literally had John McDowell sitting here. I've got sellers in front of me and I've got Kant's critique of pure reason. Yeah. This was, I bought this copy of the critique when I was 19 that was 20 <laughs> years ago. And when I was at Oxford recently, so this is the Norman Camp Smith edition. When I was at Oxford recently at Blackwell's, I picked myself up a new edition, the Paul Geyer 
translation, which is much more reliable. So I've been working on an awful lot of mind world related stuff uh, yeah. and not so much as the metaphysics stuff. But I'm also I'm delivering a paper um, at a symposium in April on um, it, it's a symposium on uh, Ratzinger. The thought mm. of Joseph Ratzinger, the Benedict the Sixteenth, yeah, and it's on his theological concept of the person. Um, so I actually have to go and learn something about the thought <laughs> of Ratzinger uh, in time for that. Uh, so that's something else. So working on a epistemolo- lot of epistemological stuff, working on Ratzinger and this paper, and at the minute, just you know, university education. You know, right. so bearing in mind my employment. Um, <laughs> yeah, got to keep that going, right? Yeah, <laughs> a, t- a ton of so we're just doing a ton of administration um, mm-hmm. at the minute. So a- awful, awful lot of stuff, and I'm just getting over a heavy dose of the cold. You can probably hear it in my voice. You know, my voice is kind of a bit sort of Johnny Cash like. Oh yeah, um, yeah, a little bit. I can yeah. Now that now that you mention it, but it's subtle. So, yeah. A lot of a lot of stuff going on, staying busy, and you know, hopefully, I mean, there's a few things in the pipeline, you know, which are coming out, uh, publication wise. Um, I'll just keep you informed of them when they do come out, when when I can actually reveal them. Yeah, well, please do because we'll obviously mm. bug you on the channel to uh, share and discuss that uh, when the time arises. So, mm. in the meantime. God bless you, Gavin. Thank you, as always, for taking the time to be here. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in and all the great. We got a very, we have a super solid group. And no, so not everybody here agrees, right? We have a lot of different yeah. perspectives. Yeah. I hope that you see that we treat all these perspectives with respect and that we are mm. here to seriously hear uh, mm. your your thoughts, your challenges, all of that. So everybody is, mm. is, 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 is welcome to this channel. That's what we're here to do. Yeah. Uh, and I hope that people enjoy it uh, and if you do please do us a favor the best thing you can do to support this channel is after the live stream like comment give your thoughts i'm trying to engage more in social media uh forgive me if i don't respond to every comment i've got a lot of different projects too but leaving your thoughts and comments really helps it does grow keep the conversation going share it uh if you like what we're doing i'll just uh, ask that favor of all of you guys thank you gavin thank all of you and we'll see you guys next time farewell